Welcome to Organize Strike Repeat, a web series that highlights the work of organizers in the Democratic Socialists of America. On this podcast, we share concrete experiences, campaigns, and strategies that move us toward democratic socialism. I'm Kevin Richardson, a philosophy professor and member of the DSA National Political Committee. And I'm Maggie Johnston, therapist, graduate student, and organizer with NC Piedmont DSA. In this episode, we interview Christian, an organizer from DSA North Texas and a member of the DSA National Political Committee. She talks to us about police abolition and transformative justice. Well, we're really excited to, to talk to you today, Christian, and I would love to just start off by asking you a little bit about your, your journey with anti-racist work and what it's looked like in your DSA and sort of how you got started and how you've ended up where you've ended up today. Great, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I started off this type of work, I should say anti-racist work, um, actually with a group called the North Texas Dream Team. Um, and this was back in 2015, I think. Um, and they were a grassroots organization primarily focused on um, DACA, but also just like undocumented uh, immigrant issues in the North Texas area. Um, it was a, I mean, pretty expansive area. <laughs> North Texas is like 25% of the state, um, but there really aren't a whole bunch of groups, especially youth led, especially like non, uh, non nonprofit groups um, or these like national organizations. And so um, I started off with that group with just like an old uh, college friend had asked like, hey, come, can you come out? And, um, you know, my parents uh, came from Mexico, but um, they, uh, my dad got amnesty through Reagan. And, um, and so like, we had never had the like mixed status um, issues that I think a lot of um, immigrant youth, you know, um, are very familiar with. Um, but it was still something that was like prevalent in the, in my extended family. Um, you know, I had friends um, and family that we've lost to border violence and um, family members and detention centers. So um, I was familiar, but not super like well-versed in um, all that like included the immigration uh, industrial complex. And so um, with the, with the North Texas Dream Team, we, we started focusing on DACA primarily because um, it was obviously a, um, a program that enabled people to um, have some sort of security in this country, be able to work, um, but also sort of not have to fear deportation. And um, we were able to do this like workshop program where people basically, we trained volunteers to guide people through the uh, application, but um, applicants themselves actually completed their application. So it was very much like they were learning the ins and outs of the program. We hired pro bono attorneys to come in and, um, you know, uh, or we, we got them to come in and help out. And so it became this like multi-generational sort of like uh, project to where um, like people, applicants would then come back as volunteers. And so it was just very self-sustaining, very much like local businesses would donate food for the day. And we were able to really get a bunch of stuff done with like very minimal cost. Um, which was great because then we could, um, any money that we collected, we could just put towards DACA fees, which is like four ninety five dollars is a pretty uh, hefty sum, especially if you have more than one kid, which was sometimes the case. And um, so that was what really like got me into this type of work of realizing how much like the U.S. government profits off of uh, immigrants for the sake of like something completely arbitrary and completely, in my opinion, made up. Um, and as a way of like controlling and as a way of obviously like, um, you know, uh, sort of creating this like model immigrant narrative that was really, um, I think, both hurtful to um, our communities, but also hurtful to the movement at large, because like a lot of people really bought into like, oh, dreamers, and they started associate it with graduation. And it really created this like, bad versus good immigrant narrative that um, was really, really, I think, really set back the movement. But that was sort of like my first uh, intro into anti-racist work and understanding that like we didn't have to depend on the government to do things or like we didn't have to accept things as they were. Um, and even when I was doing that work, I didn't see it as like inherently political. I just thought it was like good. <laughs> um, and it wasn't really until uh, one of one of our um, group members was like, hey, I have this friend that reached out and he's working for this campaign and they want a bunch of people to go to Vegas because they need Spanish speakers and they want to talk about like immigration issues specifically. And I was like, that sounds great. Like, 
I'm, I'm game, you know? And uh, it turned out to be, uh, you know, going to go block block for Bernie Sanders. And <laughs> that's, that was how I sort of got into the, the fold of, uh, of Bernie and, you know, my politics shifting left and really understanding that what I was doing was political. Um, but just, I did never had the language for, for what I was doing. So um, that was definitely like an interesting <laughs> ride to go from like, yeah, I'm on board to sort of having solidarity with, with these uh, people that I was working with to realizing, oh, there's like this whole other, <laughs> this whole other world of politics and understanding of, of these systems that um, I would have never been uh, privy to had I not just been like willing to sort of go, uh, go with whatever. So from there, uh, so that's when you, like doing this Bernie work, that was the first introduction to you uh, substantially with DSA. So how did, like, what did you, I guess the principal campaigns that you work on, or things you did, like, like when you got into DSA, what kind of work did you do? And yeah, how did you, how did you do that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, with, with the burning campaign that obviously just strengthened my um, understanding of the electoral system and um, quickly after that, obviously uh, got into um, being a national delegate for Bernie and I got to see firsthand the hijinks that is the Democratic Party um, and uh, was very much disillusioned by it um, and was sort of like, oh, well, you know, I got, I was very quickly burned <laughs> by, by that whole process. And I think it would have been really easy uh, to sort of just like go back to what I was doing and not really move uh, my politics forward had it not been for um, a DSA member asking me if I wanted to join DSA. <laughs> um, so it was that simple ask of like, hey, um, come join us. And, you know, I knew all the people that were in DSA. They um, were, uh, you know, Bernie people for the most part locally. And so I was like, yeah, they sound great. Like, let's do it. Um, and, um, you know, I went from my first meeting, I think, being in August of 2016 to uh, getting convinced to run for co-chair <laughs> in October. Um, and so that was like, it was a very quick uh, jump uh, into leadership of DSA, but um, it really became pressing because right around that time was when um, both um, Philando Castile was murdered. So in July, that was really my first like non-immigrant uh, related sort of work in, in, in the anti-racist realm and understanding the um, connection between police brutality and uh, detention centers and sort of just like seeing those firsthand. Um, and then, um, and also just like, I guess, a broader understanding of the police and um, moving that into uh, the uh, campaign around Standing Rock was actually one of the first things that we did as a DSA chapter. Um, and that was crucial both because we were considered to be at the head of the Black Snake um, as it was called, because um, Dallas is actually home to the headquarters for Energy Transfer Partners, um, the CEO um, uh, that owns the company that owns the Dakota Access Pipeline lives in Dallas. Um, I protested in front of his house many times <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, got to actually really build this broader coalition and, and relationships with a lot of um, Dallas Indigenous uh, folks and um, really understanding, like, how Standing Rock was not just about uh, clean water, but it was also the ways that like the police really went to great lengths to protect capital. Um, and not only getting to see that on the realm of Dallas to where we were mostly like protesting outside Kelsey Warren's house and um, outside the headquarters, but also um, we were able to collect a bunch of donations and, um, and money. And we actually drove <laughs> to Standing Rock I think this was right before uh, Donald Trump's election that we drove up there. It was an 18 hour drive. Um, and about maybe two hours before we got to the reservation, um, we saw somebody pulled over. And for some reason, I just had this like feeling like I need to, I need to like pull over and see what's up. Um, and they actually had a bunch of canoes with them. It turned out to be like the indigenous Red Cross that was headed to Standing Rock. And they were afraid to sort of go up there because the police were pulling people over with canoes because they were saying, oh, this is an intent to, uh, to commit a crime. And so we actually were able to follow them um, to Standing Rock and sort of be there as like, uh, as protection. I'm not sure what we could have done, but you know, sort of just like bearing witness. And it really was sort of my, my, uh, my first like understanding of like the gravity of both the situation. And I think like, 
you often, when you're doing things, you don't really think about like the historical aspect of this, like, oh, this is history happening. Um, but just realizing just like the resilience and fortitude of like, um, of, of these people really just coming together um, because these were like their needs that were being threatened um, was such a beautiful showing both of solidarity, but also like resistance. Um, and it really just cemented for me how like, no matter how much I participated willingly in like elections that ultimately like this was where power came from was from direct action. And um, so being able to sort of like get DSA involved in those efforts and really building relationships and, and um, being led by uh, indigenous people who often like not weren't necessarily like organizers in the traditional sense, but often already had the like instincts and obviously knew, um, you know, what things they needed. Um, and so it was really just beautiful to sort of be able to um, buttress those efforts and really just like, you know, uh, provide some guidance, but mostly like for provide support by getting people out there. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really um, struck when I listen to you talk about this. It really reminds me of um, how a lot of the issues that we have on the left, it can feel kind of easy to silo them and see them as all really these separate issues. But like, as you know, talking about Standing Rock, not only is this about, you know, um, like eco-socialism and justice there, and not only is it about, um, you know, indigenous rights, um, but it's also about anti, you know, police brutality and um, how these like these issues are just really fundamentally connected, and I can imagine how that really uh, strengthened your like development as an organizer and like your work going forward. Um, how did you? What kind of prompted the formation of the um, of the anti-racist working group um, in your chapter? Like, how did you form that, and yeah, what kind of happened there? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that there was uh, definitely a feeling uh, both like leading up to um, and post Trump's uh, election of like, hey, these are the groups that are really being targeted by this administration. Um, and, you know, at the time I was still doing work with the North Texas Dream Team when I was involved with DSA. So I, it was an interesting uh, time where I was in leadership of two organizations. But um, we, I remember like right around that time, we, we had this like um, huge community meeting and we invited uh, obviously like DSA was invited but we invited a bunch of different groups um, and we primarily focused on groups that we felt like uh, Trump's administration was intentionally targeting um, and so we invited like trans pride initiative um, to make sure that people um, from the trans community were present to you know be able to um, sort of say like what issues were really coming up and um, and, 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 you know, a bunch of other different groups. And that was super helpful to sort of like what you were talking about of cementing this idea that like all of our struggles are connected. <laughs> and this was, you know, this was prior to me sort of understanding the concept of collective liberation. Um, but it really, to me, like I, I felt the practice of it before I ever had the language for it. Um, of people realizing like, oh, well, if we get rid of this, then like this makes this easier. Um, and that actually, all of that sort of together um, was really helpful for me because then I was like, okay, what, what can we do as, a, as DSA to sort of like strengthen all of these efforts to sort of um, <clears throat> build like an anti-racist um, political line uh, locally and within DSA. And so um, that actually prompted somebody uh, to suggest like, hey, y'all should read Angela Davis. Um, our prison's obsolete. <laughs> and, you know, even though I was making these connections, I sort of was like, I mean, like, yeah, prisons don't seem good, but also like, I don't get how this is connected to the work that I'm doing, right? Um, because I was like, I'm, I'm still very much like an immigrant rights organizer and that's always what I called myself. And so I didn't really understand like what the connection was, but I was willing to give it a chance. And, you know, I'd heard of Angela Davis. I'd, I'd seen like quotes and whatnot, but never really read um, any of her work. And so um, I was willing to give that a shot and suggested to the group like, hey, let's let's start with reading this. Um, and one of the things there that was also super important to me was always that, um, well, there's like a myriad of things that people could read um, of like political theory. Um, I think it's always important. And I think it always feels uh, that much more like it gets that much more ingrained in you as an organizer when you're reading things that are relevant to the work that's happening. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I gave that a chance. I was like, okay, this sounds like it might be relevant. And, you know, we, we read Angela Davis and I was like, 
oh, <laughs> um, being able to sort of understand, like, actually, you know, um, striving towards being an abolitionist and uh, understanding abolition as a concept and a practice is actually more like a more radical approach to the work that I'm doing. <laughs> because if we get rid of prisons, like that's, that's also solving the issue of like, the, the issues we encounter um, as immigrant rights organizers. And that's like all in the same page. And I think for me also understanding like, Dallas was one of the highest counties in the country for deportations. Um, but knowing that 70% of those deportations um, were because of police encounters. And so like, we're not for the police, you know, so many of those deportations wouldn't be happening. And um, so really being able to sort of like, um, provide like this framework for understanding um, how these struggles uh, interconnected and using something like Angela Davis, where we would um, both like assign chapters, but also read parts of it um, in the working group and then sort of go into like the work that was happening and using that um, as fuel for our strategy for how we how we moved along campaigns um, was just like, it was just the, it just felt super connected. <laughs> and I think just made everyone feel really very much like we were taking both the advice and the like um, the energy from like all the work that's happened in decades and decades before us because I think that's also super important that not only are we not siloed as people but also like even through time like we have we have all of these uh, you know decades and decades of struggle to thank for us being in this moment and it sometimes doesn't feel that way until we're like sort of realizing like, oh, this we're taking on this like um, this energy and work that that many people have devoted their lives to. Um, and yeah, so that was that was sort of where we we were really kind of moving uh, forward anti-racist work um, was in um, reading Angela Davis, but also getting involved in, in those local efforts such as Standing Rock. Um, and I think then we moved um, pretty quickly into the ju juvenile curfew fight. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the work you've done with the on the community police oversight board um just as a you know in just as a dsa member like what what you did there because i've heard really great things about what you've done so um i would like to hear you talk about a little bit and how you did it yeah um so um the police oversight initiative campaign was um, done through a coalition of organizations, which DSA was a part of. Um, and actually, we were doing this at the same time as the fight for paid sick time. <laughs> um, and um, this, um, the paid sick time fight started when I was co-chair of North Texas. Um, and so that was sort of was like, I was leading and coordinating that effort. And then um, I became the racial justice chair and wasn't the chair anymore. And like, people were like, no, but we only want Christian to lead this. So um, it moved into the racial justice group, even though like, yes, it's somewhat racial justice related, but also it probably should have gone into healthcare working group. But anyway, um, so we were doing that. And then um, along came uh, the opportunity to join the uh, community police oversight coalition. And so uh, one of my comrades was leading those efforts. And um, you know, it, it was, we already had a civilian police review board, but it didn't have a lot of teeth. It was very much like uh, people that were sort of just okay with the status quo, um, that didn't have any understanding of like the police as an oppressive institution. And, um, and so it was, it was really interesting to see like these two things sort of like uh, moving forward simultaneously and being strengthened and like all of a sudden having all these really new relationships with other organizations. Um, and so that, um, those two campaigns actually culminated <laughs> on the same day um, at city council. There was two huge votes, one for paid sick and one for the police oversight board. Um, and um, my understanding is paid sick was not unanimous, but the oversight board was. Um, so it was two, two big wins in one day, which was, you know, we felt like, wow, like on top of the world, um, which, you know, didn't last very long. But um, the point was, at that point, we were like, great, we have a police oversight board that we can move quickly on. Um, but through my work, actually, with uh, paid sick, um, and through the earlier, like, juvenile curfew fight, um, that, again, was sort of like, building on this idea of like policing and especially in my district where um, the juvenile curfew was disproportionately enforced. Um, I built a really good relationship with my councilman just because I was always like 
I'm going to run against you if you fuck up. <laughs> and also like, Hey, like, how can we, how can we improve, um, you know, this, because this is largely affecting Latino youth. And my brother was in that same age demographic and lived in the district. So, you know, it was also a very personal issue for me. And um, so he was like, well, you know, for the oversight board, every council person has to appoint somebody to the board. Um, would you want to be the appointee? And honestly, at that point, I was like, I don't have like a whole bunch of time. Um, and I was kind of hoping that he would like, be okay with me just like switching another DSA person in there. Um, but he's like, no, like if it's not you, then I'm going to go to other people that I have in mind also. So I was like, oh, okay, shit. Well, I guess I have to. <laughs> so um, I, I just didn't want to let it go um, for somebody that was like, that had my politics um, because I knew that even though, um, you know, my councilman is on the progressive wing of, of council, but there are definitely a lot of people who are not. And yeah, sure enough, <laughs> most of the appointees are very much like, uh, I mean, there are, some of them are liberals, a lot of them are conservative, um, you know, for a couple of them, they think that the main focus on the police oversight board is like how to improve relationships between the police and the community. And I'm like, I don't see where that is implied in the name. <laughs> you know, for me, I'm like, we're the, we're the eyes and ears keeping watch over the, over the police. Like we're oversight, like of the police. And um, so I know I'm like in the minority on that, on the oversight board. And um, at first I was like a little, um, you know, timid going into that because it's, you know, it's an official board. I'd been on a board before, but um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't so, uh, there wasn't so much excitement over it. And honestly, like our, the first meeting that I, um, well, the meeting before my first meeting, like the cops uh, totally took over the meeting. They like, uh, harassed a bunch of people, assaulted some people during the meeting. There was like minutes missing from the official meeting uh, video. And yeah, it was, it was very not okay. And so the next meeting was my first meeting and, um, you know, they had it in a, in a bigger space. There was a bunch of people who very rightfully so were angry about like things not moving forward. Um, and it also became really clear to me that like people had this idea of what the oversight board was. Um, that was very different from what it actually was and what we had the power to do, um, which I think was really frustrating for me as somebody who was like, yeah, we should have more power. Like, um, that we need to be an independent body. Like, we, we need to be able to, to have some type of say over what happens with, with, the, with the police in these instances. And, um, but, you know, the, it, it, I, it was really like the first couple of meetings, I sort of took pace of like, where individual board members were in terms of like their views on the police. Um, and that was really helpful to me because then it helped me sort of like know what people to sort of be able to rely on. And also like in the future, if there's anything that needs to be introduced, I could kind of count on them. And the chair of the police oversight board is actually really great and um, has, a, has a very deep understanding of um, the police as an oppressive institution. And so um, the uprising really, is what provided this opportunity to be like, well, fuck it, I'm gonna go all, like I'm gonna show my true colors in this board meeting. Um, and, you know, being able to talk about, you know, we started off that meeting right after George Floyd was murdered. Um, you know, um, the chair read off all the names of anybody that's been affected by policing um, in this country um, for the, the eight minutes and 46 seconds. Um, and, you know, we, we talked about, um, what policing meant, and we talked about Black Lives Matter, and um, you know, actually, one of the board members ended up resigning from that meeting because uh, she was already somebody that the community was saying like she shouldn't represent us on the board. She doesn't believe in the in the cause of the board, and um, very much had a apparently she had like a Blue Lives Matter flag at home that somebody found out that she flew that. Um, and she said something like all lives matter on the call. And I remember just being like, okay, I'm going to say something. And I did. And I was very like clear about like, these are my politics and I don't believe in the police. And, um, you know, I was like, if, if she can be on here, like believing the police are good, then I can be on here believing the police are bad. And, um, so it actually was a little bit liberatory, honestly, to be able to just like, speak my politics and and not feel like I was going to get kicked off the board and just be counterproductive to getting anything done. Um, but in that meeting, we were able to push a resolution to um, have access to 
um, DPD uh, dash cams and um, body cameras. And that was something um, that was like the art. We have a police monitor that sort of like administrates the work that we do and that she had been like wanting and was having a lot of pushback from the police chief on being able to do. And so um, it was great to, for me to be able to introduce that and that to pass unanimously. Um, and actually like um, that was also like just being built on like decades of work by groups like Mothers Against Police Brutality, a bunch of other groups that have been doing this work so diligently that allowed like that motion not only to pass unanimously, but for the police chief to feel the pressure enough to where um, she recently released um, a, uh, a memo saying that like now within 72 hours, those videos had to be released. Um, and so that, you know, it's not obviously like uh, the of abolition that um, a lot of us want, but I do think that it's like anything that we can do to reduce the harm that's happening in this moment is is progress, right? Like anything we can do to keep moving things forward. Um, and then one of the other things was, uh, you know, just being able to be really um, like attuned to what was happening and and sort of getting all this information that you know, the, the broader community doesn't always have access to and, and kind of understanding where complaints were coming from. Um, and um, that actually, through that work, I was able to um, learn that we had like mid-year appropriations um, coming up and that in that budget allocation stuff, like there was six and a half million that was gonna be going towards the police and this was being snuck in into the consent agenda <laughs> and like there were like 43 items on the consent agenda so i mean i don't not that i don't blame the council people to like for going through it but honestly most of the time you know they're like these are really like very duh sort of things and so i remember calling my councilman and being like did you know that there's like police stuff in here <laughs> and he didn't know and you know so he was able to um you know get that item pulled and we were like our group, our, uh, our city, our future, which has been largely doing participatory budgeting work, um, was able to get a bunch of people to sign on for that specific agenda item and being like, y'all aren't slick, like <laughs> we see this happening. And yes, even though it's like covering money for the police, like no, like not a single cent. And so um, we got about 23 people, I think signed up to speak on that item, which is a lot for city council, honestly. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it didn't end up passing and not only did it not end up passing like by a small margin, it was like only two people voted against it. Um, and so, um, that was like, you know, it felt like a, a very significant win for us, not in the sense that like, you know, six and a half million is chump change to the police department, considering how much goes to the police in our city. But, um, it did make us realize like how, how we were able to just like, navigate these systems and like be on the same page with like people in power and that like often we think of like elected officials as these like all knowing like super experienced professionals and it's like no it's just like <laughs> most of the time they're just like uh you know the rest of us and have other people doing things for them but um yeah I mean I, I think like with the oversight board and specifically you know obviously there's um, it, it is, it is somewhat of just like a basic reform. I don't think it's going to have like a huge, um, effect on like actually eliminating the power of the police. But I do think that it's, uh, it's, it's a really helpful way to sort of showcase that like no amount of oversight is going to stop the police from doing what they're going to do. Um, so it, it, in any ways, it might just like show how like, it's the police that are the problem and not the fact that they're not being like looked after. So uh, you mentioned, so you mentioned transformation a couple of different times. And so it's, it seems like a, a part of your vocabulary and part of like framing a lot of organizing things. And I know that transformation, uh, trans transforming as an organizer, transforming who you are um, during your organizing is also related to uh, the idea of transformative justice, um, which is also connected to abolition. So there's a lot of connections there. And I just wanted to like, yeah, hear from you about like your take on transformative justice or how do you see transform transformation playing a role in these organizing spaces? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, one thing that I, I just felt like was sort of missing from um, the discourse both in DSA and definitely um, you know, nationally um, and outside of DSA was this idea of like um, 
what it meant to like not create cycles of harm and how to shift to a culture of care and understanding and healing. Um, and I definitely say that as somebody who uh, has very much mastered like compartmentalizing my own emotions about uh, everything going on. I think that if I succumb to all of my feelings about everything uh, that I both experience and see and understand and read, I would just be a puddle in my bed and just like never do anything. Um, be completely immobilized by just like the gravity of like how much suffering exists in the world. Um, and so I think one thing that like really helped me was just building a, um, a group of friends and a lot of it was with uh, Our City, Our Future because um, predominantly like the group is uh, women and non-binary people of color and like um, the atmosphere during those meetings is just so much different than what I've experienced in like mostly DSA spaces um, to where there's like people are checking in with each other in like a very genuine way and not just sort of like a oh like how are you <laughs> but very much like how is your heart you know like how are you feeling um, and you know it's it's you can tell the difference because people are willing to sort of be more vulnerable and say you know what today I'm just like not having a good day, like I'm really caught up on this thing and, and just knowing that, okay, well, this person's not going to be able to sort of like uh, contribute uh, to this, this sort of thing, but they just need like us to focus on helping them feel better or whatever. And so um, just like this, this idea that like, we're all people that need healing because we've, we've suffered so much under capitalism and not only suffered like as ourselves, but have inherited a lot of that trauma uh, and a lot of that suffering. And, you know, more pe uh, some people more than others, especially given like what, you know, what experiences or what, um, you know, state sanctioned violence occurred to, to the people, the group of people that you might come from. Um, and that's real. Like, I just feel like that doesn't, that hurt and that trauma doesn't go anywhere. Right. Like we, it has to stay in, in some place. And a lot of it is like within us. Um, and, and that like, I think when we, we sort of like use that as a way to understand how people like navigate these systems, how they go about the world, how it, how it affects relationships, how it affects the way that we work with each other, um, how we trust each other, I think is also a big thing. And um, I think Mike Hiko, who's on the NPC with me, said something about like, we have to move at the pace of trust. And I always thought like the way that she phrased that was just so beautiful because I, I do think that that has a lot to do with it in that like um, we, as we're sort of like healing and, and transformed, like that's not a process that you're just like doing by yourself. Like, yes, like you heal by yourself, but also you're transformed because with, with other people and it requires other people to be transformed. And so even if the healing is internal, like the transformation has to happen with other people. And I think that like the, one of the only successful ways to do that is participating in collective struggle and sort of understanding that like, if you're, um, you know, if you're at the, if you're facing off against white supremacists, which I've done with like comrades who I don't necessarily like, I don't know their middle name. I don't know where they, they grew up, but I do know that if we're standing in, you know, with cops on one side and Nazis on the other side, that they have my back. And that's what's important, right? Um, that's what matters. And that like, we're, that feeling of like, I don't even have to know this person. I can just recognize their humanity and know that like, they're willing to risk their lives for me. And I'm willing to do the same. It was just like super powerful. And I think also super connects us to like other people's humanity. And the more that we recognize the humanity in each other, I think the better off we are. Um, because I think it ultimately helps us sort of dismantle like these um, systems of punishment, these systems of um, what sort of contributes to this concept of cancel culture. Um, and even that, that feeling of like wanting revenge, because I think that's something that we don't often grapple with uh, within DSA is that like, yes, we want accountability and yes, we want justice, but what does that look like? What does that actually mean? Um, because I think often there's this like, um, there's this like, well, you know, if you're, uh, one thing that I think I learned the hard way was I had uh, a friend who, um, you know, someone had said like he had done harm to them. And like, I instantly was like, well, bye. Like, I'm not going to be friends with this person anymore. Not realizing that like that actually didn't even help either because I like, he also needs somebody to have that. Ha he needed to have people that he was in relationship with to help him understand how to not cause harm in the future. 
um, or just like be there to sort of like help navigate the process um, as he sort of learned how to how to unpack that harm, you know, and so that there's just like this, this need to where like, you still have to stay in relationship often with, with people who do harm. And uh, because there's this like, very inherent need to understand that we both are all, we're all capable of harm and that we're all capable of being harmed. And so the more that we can understand that like relationship, the more that we can sort of start to, to lay the groundwork for how we um, then like uh, create spaces where harm isn't um, accepted or where harm is addressed in a uh, way that feels um, complete to people, but also like acknowledging that um, it's not going to feel complete to somebody if they haven't done the work to sort of understand um, like the cycles of harm. And so it can't just be sort of like this, uh, this process to where like people come in and they're just going to be ready to understand it because I definitely see why, you know, when people um, are harmed, they immediately, they immediately want like them, you know, they want X, Y, or Z things, but it doesn't mean that they've really like interrogated whether what they want is rooted in like um, lessening harm and creating like a space of, of care, or if it's sort of just like, I just want them to like be out and me not have to deal with it anymore. Um, because harm, so like even that, that person still goes somewhere else. <laughs> right. And I think that like, we have to really, uh, contend with this idea of like disposability because we know that like disposability is a tool of capitalism and that the disposability of people um, specifically is, is like the biggest weapon that they have and so we know that we can't use those same weapons um, we know we have to we have to find alternative ways and sometimes that sucks that sometimes that's hard because it, it, like we're just so used to living under um, under capitalism and sort of like what we think is like justice and what we think is, um, you know, uh, resolution. And um, I think being able to sort of like interrogate that within yourself and as a, as a community, which is why I really like stress the importance of not only reading theory, but also reading, um, you know, uh, I think, well, specifically reading books about like transformative justice and like what that means um, and sort of also what people have in practice done um, to, you um, to navigate that because it's not easy. And um, I think we first and foremost want to make sure that people feel safe um, and that people aren't harmed. Um, but again, like if we're wanting to dismantle like the systems that often govern, you know, these processes, which is the police, it's it, abolition is just as much about building um, alternatives. Like they're not just going to pop up because we get rid of the police. And, and if anything, if we don't really like take the time to unpack like this, like the need to be, to oppress and to dominate and to punish within ourselves. Like we're just going to recreate those things whenever it comes time to building new things. Um, and so as much as possible, like being open to like things that feel uncomfortable and, and like just not letting ourselves sit with that alone, but um, focusing on like abolition as a practice and, 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 you know, really thinking about like, okay, what, how can this be different? How is this going to be um, something new? Um, I think is, is what's going to end up sort of helping us navigate some of these tricky situations. Um, and, 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 you know, I think um, I'm, I'm hopeful that because as more and more people are becoming um, aware and learning about what it means to be an abolitionist and, and sort of, and of course, like I, I consider myself very much a baby to everything abolition. Um, I've learned so much from a bunch of other people. Um, especially a bunch of, um, you know, radical black women um, that I, I'm happy to have relationships with um, about, about this. And, um, you know, um, I think we'll be better off because we'll definitely like be closer to that new world that we're always talking about. Thank you so much for taking your time and talking about this with us today. Uh, I know for a fact, even though Kevin sometimes has a little bit of a stone face that uh, this is a really exciting um, <laughs> thing to be talking about, something we really try to grapple with a lot. So um, it's cool to hear some some concrete ideas about like what we can do and how we can transform ourselves and do this kind of work. Yeah, um, like as Maggie said, like thanks for coming and sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. Um, I, I found it to be very helpful. Um, I found a lot in what you said like it resonates with me and so I struggle to like not interrupt and talk um to give space because i'm like oh 
I agree with that, and I agree with that, and that's happening in our chapter. And I, okay, have to Christian has to share, have to relax. But like, yeah, this is these kind of things. I mean, we're hoping that this podcast like creates makes people start thinking, having these conver- conversations with other people in their chapter, and even people who aren't in the DSA start to think about some of these things because a lot of people like there's a lot in what you said that resonates with folks. Um, so. No, thanks again for for coming on. Yeah, and I mean, I think if that's one takeaway, like uh, that, I could I could even want from people, like even if everybody forgets everything that I said, um, just this idea of what you mentioned about like having these conversations with comrades in your chapter, um, having these conversations with your family, with your friends, like people that you just. I mean, I've had these conversations with coworkers and like my bosses <laughs> um, because I have no like boundaries when it comes to talking about things. Um, because I think that the more matter of fact that we make these these sort of conversations and like every day uh, make it an everyday thing, um, the more that that helps. Because I, you know, I've had these conversations with my dad, especially because I'm just like dying to make him a leftist. Um, but he, you know, he has a lot of things he disagrees with me on, but it's like, you know, it's, it's a journey. And I think that like, we have to think about the fact we've, we've, this is how our, this is our entire like belief system for the longest time. Um, and it might come more easily to some people like growth might be like uh, from one month to another. I definitely know I was like, I think I had like an NYPD shirt, uh, just for full transparency, like at some point, because I was really, I, well, I still kind of am obsessed with law and order SVU. Um, and you know, didn't think anything of it. And now I'm like, fuck that shirt. I'm so glad I don't have that shirt anymore. Um, and that was like within the course of a year. Right. Uh, and like, I think just being willing to like understanding both how hard it is for you to like unlearn things, but also how easy it is for you to accept things but like other people are in that same mindset also. Um, so just being patient and being willing to work through that. Um, if that's the only thing you take away is like, please have these conversations with other people, people especially that don't already agree with us because we need as many people as possible to make the, make, build the world that we want to build.